You know, there's a story about the early days of City Church that has served as an anchor for me in ministry many times over. And one of the things that I talk about as a pastor is that I never heard like an audible phone call from God in terms of the fact that I was supposed to be a a pastor. But what God provided in terms of confirmation of calling for me was even better. And what God provided for me was tangible things that showed and confirmed that this is what he wanted me to do. Lisa and I had felt drawn uh, to the church our whole lives for sure, and ministry 100%. Uh, But honestly, planting a church wasn't really something that uh, was like we knew we wanted to do it our our whole lives. And uh, essentially what happened is over a period of time, somebody kind of came up to me and said, hey, you know, I think you might be good at this. And so before I knew it, I was in this church planter training seminar thing with several other prospective planters and their spouses. And uh, uh, I, the initial game plan as I was kind of growing into this group and, you know, learning about it more was not that I would be the pastor. <laughs> the initial game plan was a trio and I was going to be helping behind the scenes and production like, you know, kind of as was my background. And, and I was going to be doing like some music stuff and things like that, maybe from time to time. But as the course began to unfold, I just felt God stirring something in my heart uh, that he was calling me to lead. And so Lisa and I prayed about it, and we started to make plans to plant a church. Our initial game plan was that we would plant a church from within an existing church. Uh, I was on staff at a larger church at the time, and, uh, and you know, Basically, it's a common model that's used where after a church gets enough kind of people and resources of their own, they eventually go off and uh, start their own congregation, but they get that little shelter period from within where they're still in the home church or the planting church. Now, the best part of that for me was that it would enable me to keep my full-time job and pursue my calling. Um, So that was kind of a win-win as a newly married person who had just bought a townhouse in Anaheim wondering where bills are going to be paid from. And uh, so... So initially, the church that I was on staff at was all on board. They were excited about it. They said, well, that's great. Um, And so we scheduled this uh, uh, vision night where we were going to do a couple of things. We were going to talk about the vision for the church, but we were also had a clear goal to raise some funds uh, because we needed to get this thing off the ground and needed to get it started. So uh, we get to the, the, the night, a lot of people come, and, and they're there, and so we're sharing, the, uh, right before the meeting starts, and before we share the vision, God put a nightclub on my mind, or a club of some sorts. It's like almost like I could see it, and a friend of mine who had come there for the night, and he was going to do like the quote-unquote ask part of the giving for us um, to ask people to help generate some funds, I, I told him before it started, I said, you know, I feel like God put like a nightclub on my mind. Do you think I should like just prophetically share it? And his response, which I've told many times before, was, well, how confident are you that God told you that? And I said, like, pretty confident. I feel like that's what God put on my heart. And he's like, okay, then you should share it. So like a good prophet, I kept it to myself that evening. And I told no one except him. (laughs) And we go through the night and, uh, you know, we end the evening and it went pretty well. Um, and then that week starts the next work week and I get a phone call about midweek from one of the leaders of the organization or the church I was on staff at at the time. And the phone call started a little something like this. It went, Kyle, I love you, but how many of you have ever gotten a call like that in your life? And you know, it's not going to go in a good direction. It's building you up for a letdown, right? So basically what had happened was the leadership did a 180. And where they were totally okay with this idea, suddenly they were not. And I was shocked and I was super bummed. I had just shared this vision with all of these people uh, about doing a church within a church. What would we do now? And so uh, that call ends and it's like around 3 or 4 p.m. ish. And, uh, you know, kind of hang up the phone, wrap things up at work. And I had dinner scheduled with someone who was a part of our ministry uh, that night. And so I'm getting together. And as I'm known to be sort of have my heart on my sleeve, he could noticeably tell I was bumming about something. And he asked me what was wrong. And I just told him what was going on. And we weren't going to have a venue or I was going to be forced to decide between my job and planning the church. And what were we going to do? And he just said, you know, my sister used to go to shows at this place called Chain Reaction. I was like, what's Chain Reaction? (laughs) 
And so we were right down the street at Flame Broiler. And so we go down there after dinner and I go up to the ticket booth window and the owners of the club just so happened to be there that night next door. And I start talking to them, share my vision and my heart with them. And in more or less these words, they said, you know, we've been praying somebody would come here and ask us to do this. I didn't know they were believers, number one. Number two, they had literally just gotten back from a missions trip. So their hearts for wide open for whatever God would have. And so I remember asking them the next question, uh, which was, okay, well, what would you charge us to meet here? And they said, we're not going to charge you anything. You just do your part to do the work of the ministry and we'll do ours. And man, that was so true of that couple. They would get up Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, getting there, cleaning the bathrooms, making them as presentable as possible. Um, They were an integral part of our church until they moved up to Oregon uh, where they would retire. They even delayed their retirement so that we could continue to meet at at Chain Reaction. Um, And and they held on because they wanted to wait till City Church had a home where that we could call our own. So this night has been progressing. You know, 3 or 4 p.m., I find out that, you know, we're not going to be able to meet at the church around, you know, 6.30-ish, something like that, 6.15, uh, find out this place called Chain Reactions, like, hey, you can meet here, we can do it here, um, and then on the way home from Chain Reaction to our old house where we used to live, it's about a five-minute mi- five drive at the very most, and I get a phone call, and that phone call is one of those ones that you know is not going to be a quick phone call. How many of you guys have ever had that kind of a thing before? And my wife had been blowing my phone up, to be totally honest, because she's thinking to herself, is he dead? Where does he, you know, why is he late? And the next day, by the way, we were leaving for vacation. So it's not like she was just paranoid or overworried. We literally, we had a lot to do to get ready to go uh, the next morning. And so I'm like, okay, I'll take this call. So I pick up the phone call and my friend is on the other end of the call and he pretty quickly gets to the point. And he says, you know, Kyle, God has been speaking to me every single day for an entire month that I am supposed to give you a large donation to help you start the church. Not me personally, but the ministry. And he said, but there's a catch. And I told him, hey, when you give, there's not supposed to be a catch. That's not the way it works, bro. And he said, no, 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 no. God was absolutely clear with me that you are supposed to leave your job. He had no idea anything that had happened in my whole day and the progression of events. So he said, listen, I'm going to donate $30,000. He was 24 at the time. Um, He wound up donating $50,000 as a 24-year-old young man uh, who lived overseas. And so Lisa and I went on vacation after this long day, and it gave us a week to really just agree with God in what God had already made clear, uh, that this was what he wanted us to do. And so even though I never received like an audible calling from God, what God gave me was tangible confirmation, undeniable, uh, that this is what we were supposed to do. And you know, the reason that I share this story uh, today is that this was the first time in my entire life up until that point that I had seen radical, over-the-top kind of generosity from one individual towards God. And you know, as the church has grown, uh, by the grace of God, I've seen many saints over the years do similar things. Uh, But this was my first taste, and you know, it challenged me to the fiber of my being. You know, my message title today is Giving Your Best to God. And before anybody freaks out, Don't worry, there is no campaign or push at the end of the message to give money. That's not what this is about or make a financial gift. What this is today is an example of a section in scripture that we are coming to in John chapter 12, verses 1 through 11, where we come to the story of a woman by the name of Mary of Bethany. And her brother Lazarus, to give you a little bit of context, had just been raised from the dead. And in front of everybody else, what she does is display radical radical generosity towards Jesus by anointing his feet with this very costly jar of oil, and it raised eyebrows. You know, not everybody agreed with it, but it was what God led her to do. Now, there was one commentator that I came across, and he said that in some respects, there's really no way for us to emulate this gift because it was a one-time thing that prepared Jesus and anointed him for his crucifixion, death, and burial. Uh, But that uh, commentator also pointed out uh, that it's likely that the oil that was put on on Jesus that day was so strong that it would have stayed with him during the entire Passion Week. See, this was leading into the 
week where Jesus uh, died on the cross. And so it's likely that as he was dying on the cross that he could smell the fragrance of Mary of Bethany's perfume on his body and it likely gave him strength. So even though we'll never be able to replicate uh, what Mary of Bethany did in this gift, I think the question that I'm trying to answer or provide insight to today is this. Is it possible to cherish and honor Jesus in the world today in ways that seem extravagant? That's the question that I hope to provide some answers for uh, by the end of our time today. And so if you haven't already done so, turn to the book of John chapter 12 verses 1 through 11. If you didn't bring a Bible, I always remind you, download the YouVersion app and you can turn to John uh, chapter 12 uh, that way. So we're going to read this story together, but before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Jesus, we thank you for the ways that you extravagantly love us. And it's not just words on a page, but it's tangibly displayed and confirmed repeatedly throughout our lives. And Lord, in some small way today, we want to respond to you by cherishing and honor you in ways that seem extravagant. And we pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes to see what you want us to see. We pray that you would open our ears to hear what you want us to hear. And we pray, God, that you'd open our hearts, that we would respond and become the disciples you want us to be. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. John 12, 1 says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at table with him. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to it, to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Now, what an amazing story of a woman who saved up and this found this treasured possession of her own and just poured it out at the feet of Jesus to express her love and devotion to him in this week that would lead to his death or his crucifixion, death, and burial. Uh, when you came in today, you should have gotten a note sheet. It's one of the ways we follow along and participate here with the message. The first section says, lessons in giving my best from Mary of Bethany. Um, and lessons in giving uh, really the, our best to God. And the first thing I want you to write down on your note sheet is this. Giving God my best starts when I make it a point to sit at Jesus' feet, listen to him, uh, to what he says, and honor him by doing it. Now, this was a very costly gift. Based on some research I came across this week, I learned that the average uh, Israeli worker or uh, Middle Eastern worker during this time earned about a denarius per day. So more or less, this was roughly an entire year's worth of wages that she took here and poured out in front of Jesus' feet and basically just gave away. You understand now why it generated such a strong reaction. Um, But I want to point out that Mary doesn't just like randomly one day bring all of this year's wages before the Lord in terms of this extravagance. She had cultivated a posture of being at Jesus' feet for her entire life. Um, And in fact, uh, in Luke 10, 39, shows that Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet learning. In John eleven thirty two, 32, Mary fell at Jesus' feet and surrendered to him. And by the way, uh, it's worth noting that uh, that act of surrender in John eleven thirty two 32 was when she had not received what she had wanted. Uh, and her brother Lazarus had just died, and she felt like, hey, Jesus, if you'd been here sooner, this wouldn't have happened. And yet still, nonetheless, she throws herself at the feet of Jesus and says, Lord, I, I'm here in front 
front of you, even though she wasn't happy about the outcome. And thirdly, Mary of Bethany honored and worshiped Jesus through this act of pouring out this expensive ointment at Jesus's feet. Um, Now, it's also true that Jesus had just done something very extravagant in Mary of Bethany's life. You know, if I had recently lost a loved one and somebody raised them from the dead, I'd want to do something to show some gratitude too. How about you guys? So it was like, wow, she's so excited. Her brother's back to life and she has this posture of already being at Jesus's feet all the time. So it was just like an overflow of her heart, really. And, um, you know, this was what God put in her heart to do. And it was also prophetic uh, in many ways. It pointed forward because these types of ointments were used in people's deaths. And so it really kind of kick-started the Passion Week in that way. But the kind of generosity that Mary displayed here uh, uh, was really just something that was in her heart towards the Lord the entire time and reflective of her posture before Jesus from the beginning of being at Jesus's feet, learning from him, worshiping him, listening to what he says, and doing it. Um, And so Mary of Bethany gave her best to God by doing exactly that, being at the feet of Jesus. Listen, you will never learn to give your best to God with a Judas-like attitude here as we see in this story. I'll talk more about Judas in a minute, but uh, what you want to cultivate in your own life is a Mary of Bethany type of posture towards Jesus that sits at his feet, listens to him daily, and naturally uh, wants to give him your best over time. You know, sitting at Jesus' feet is not complicated. It's actually pretty simple. It involves things like reading our Bible, you know, praying, uh, worshiping God, going to church, going to our small group. Now, it also, I think, when, means when you come to church to come with a posture of openness and wanting to hear from the Lord, not just kind of sit off on the sidelines and, you know, talk amongst your friends or something like that. And even when we're here in church, I think we need to choose that Mary of Bethany uh, kind of posture before the Lord. Uh, sitting at the feet of Jesus can look like serving because Jesus was serving all the time. That's what he did all the time. Uh, listen, there are so many ways that we can sit at the feet of Jesus and cultivate this Mary of Bethany attitude. Uh, but giving, my God, giving our best to God starts when we have that posture at the feet of Jesus. And not just to hear what he says, but actually do the last part of doing what he's asking of us. And here's a second lesson I want you to take home from uh, Mary of Bethany. Generosity won't make sense to people who aren't doing the point above. Here's what I mean by that. You see the disapproval in the story right then and there. Now, the Mark account and the Matthew account actually shed light on the fact that Judas disagreed, but he wasn't the only one. In fact, the other disciples thought so too. Judas was the only one who vocalized it. Um, You know, it's like, oh man, she did what? She poured all that on the floor? Like, think of all that we could have done with that money. Now, the greatest side swipe in the history of the church towards the work of the church is exactly the comment that's made here is we should have done more for the poor. (laughs) And it's not that it isn't true that we should care for the needs of the poor and and things like that. But man, that kind of comment, I've seen it throughout my ministerial experience too, uh, as just a way to discount the work of ministry. Um, And I love Jesus's response. He says, listen, the poor you will always have with you. But he says, but me, you will not always have. Now, I will also balance that by saying this. Jesus did more for the poor than any human being in history, amen? So when he spoke, he had tremendous authority about that. And in the same way, church leaders today, we care for the needs of the hurting and the disenfranchised. The difference is we also know the value of the work of ministry. You know, I think a similar action had been taken in 2019 and somebody poured their entire year's worth of wages onto an event that really was there and gone for one single day, like it was in the case of Mary of Bethany. Almost every church elder in the country would say, you know, I think we should have spent that money a little bit better. They'd sit back and kind of think and posture. And, and, and listen, um, I have also seen in my ministerial life, people use uh, poverty and things like that as an excuse really not to give at all. You know, generosity and the point that I'm getting at, generosity will not make sense to people who aren't sitting at the feet of the Lord. That's why it didn't make sense to Judas. And that's why it continues to be a barrier for Christians today. Now, in terms of our ex- the God's expectation for generosity for all Christians today, The Bible lays out the expectation pretty clearly. It's this thing called the tithe that literally means a tenth of our income. Uh, Now, let me be absolutely clear, though. Uh, The gift that Mary of Bethany gave was not a tithe. 
It was way beyond that. It was an extravagant above and beyond gift from a financial perspective. If you ever hear us use that word of an above and beyond gift, it just refers to any financial gift above the normal expectation. Um, You know, some have said that these gifts were heirlooms that were passed down for generations. Um, Some have said uh, that they were more like an investment fund that we might have today, but whichever way you think about it, they were highly valuable items that could be, that were to be saved and sold uh, for cash in moments of need or an opportunity or something like that. But at the beginning of the message, I shared a personal story from someone in my own life that I've witnessed display this kind of generosity. And since then, uh, you know, I've seen many more saints display this same type of generosity over and over again into the 5,000s, 10s, 20s. You know, some have come from older saints, some from younger. And the point was this, There were discerning believers listening to the voice of the Lord, sitting at the feet of Jesus, who simply honored him by doing what he was asking them to do. Now, some of you who might be newer to church might be thinking, man, if sitting at the feet of Jesus leads to that, I think I'm not going to read my Bible as much this year. (laughs) So I thought that was funny, first service. Didn't land, second service. Jeez, guys, come on. Help a pastor out. Um, Listen, uh, I got to tell you, Don't worry, you know, this is not something God's going to ask you to do often in life unless you have been blessed with an extravagant ability to do so, which, by the way, some are. And uh, God has spoken to some people uh, to be financial angels to the church of Jesus above and beyond the normal tithe. But let me calm you down a bit further uh, about things here at City Church. You know, we won't ever ask for huge financial gifts for buildings or campaigns and stuff like that from the front on Sundays. It is a promise as long as I am here. Here's what we do. We teach the Bible. We teach stories like this one where they come up. And you know, God might put something on your heart, uh, but I will also say this, should the time ever come when we have to raise a little more money than our normal income, here's what we would do. We would hold everything in an extra meeting on the side. And we would tell you very clearly up front exactly what it would be about so that going into it, you know what it's all about and there's no side swiping happening. And the reason that we do that is because Sundays are precious to us. And we know that visitors are coming. uh, Friends are coming. And we never want this to be a church uh, where you feel like, man, I brought a friend and here I got sideswiped with this giving push or something like that. You know, the most powerful form of generosity is when God puts it on your heart and you listen to him and you do what he says. Amen? Not when the pastor asks you to do it, not when the church needs it and begs because of some latest crisis that's going on. The most powerful form of generosity is when you're like Mary of Bethany, you're at the feet of Jesus and he's like, hey, this is something I want you to do and then you do it. You know, I've seen people display this kind of faith and, you know, simply put, this kind of faith won't make sense to people who aren't at Jesus' feet learning from him and worshiping him and people who aren't doing this look at it and they say, hey, that's ridiculous. What a waste. Um, but our job isn't to worry what others will think of our obedience towards Jesus. Our job is to obey God no matter what the cost and how much it hurts at the time. Having said that, I would be remiss since this came up in scripture today uh, if I don't just give you an opportunity to probe the corners of your heart. And so if you don't call yourself a Christian or you're not sure about it here today, you can tune out the next 180 seconds of this message uh, right now. And if you're here today and you'd call yourself a Christian, but you wouldn't say that this is your church, you can listen, but uh, you can just let this pass too. But if you're here today and you call yourself a Christian and City Church, your home church, uh, you know, I want to make it clear that God's word makes it clear that all of us need to be involved in the journey of generosity. Not because Pastor Kyle says it or City Church is asking, but straight up, it's just what God asks in his word from every Christian. Um, You know, the gospel keeps advancing forward through the sacrifices of the saints. And sometimes God will ask you to display Mary of Bethany like uh, a a generosity extravagance. But uh, that, that tithe part is the part that God always expects from every Christian. Now here's the last thing that I'll say about the tithe and then I'll move on. The tithe isn't something that God wants from us. It's something that God wants for us. You know, I have seen so many miracles in my own life and in the lives of others who have talked to me about when they finally made the the 
choice to give that part of their life over, that just amazing things started to happen in their life. And this story that we're reading right now has a reverse example, and the reverse example is Judas. Now, we, we uh, talked about a couple of lessons from Mary of Bethany's faith, but I want to talk now about a couple of more lessons from Judas's, what I'm calling Judas's buzzkill response here in the story. And, and the first thing I want you to write down from Judas's buzzkill response is this, Pointed questions in public settings often reveal hidden motives beneath the surface. Notice I didn't say always and every time, but in many cases, especially in church settings, pointed questions in public settings often reveal hidden motives beneath the surface. And here's what happens. In this beautifully intimate moment where Mary of Bethany is sitting at the feet of Jesus, anointing his feet and his hair uh, with this ointment, uh, here's what Judas does. He stands up in front of everybody and says, you should have given all that money to the poor instead. Imagine how crushing it would have been to this woman's heart and the act of devotion that she was showing before the Lord. But you know what the Bible says it really revealed? The Bible says it revealed that Judas was actually a thief and he would help himself to the offering bag, which somehow he managed. And I want to ask Jesus about like, oh, I'd put him in charge of that when I get to heaven. But you know, we'll get there. Uh, we'll all get there and find out together. See, what it really revealed was that money owned Judas's heart. Jesus didn't have Judas, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Jesus didn't own Judas's heart and money did. And when people get all huffy about money or really any other issue, especially in a church context, it often reveals a hidden motive hidden under the surface. Now, sadly, the church today is full of Judas-like buzzkill questions in ministry. And ultimately, these types of things never stop the work of God. I want to point that out. And I think it's worth mentioning in this story that everyone kind of moves along. You, you know, it doesn't stop her act and what she's doing. He stands up there and he says, I think she should have given that money to the poor instead. And everyone's like, that was awkward. You know what I mean? <laughs> and they all just kind of move forward. And so it doesn't stop anything. And similarly in church today, these kind of moments don't stop ministry. They're just extremely frustrating, especially for church leaders uh, along the way to deal with that kind of disappointment and disapproval. Um, and I've sat in church meetings with disgruntled individuals who did not get their way, uh, and they store up all this negative energy uh, about a disagreement to point it out in a public context of some sort. And it's really ugly when it happens. Um, and it used to really bother me. It still bothers me, but not as badly as it used to. But now I know uh, that these kinds of pointed questions in public settings often reveal hidden motives under the surface. You know, there are times that that's not the case. And it's a well-meaning believer with a well-meaning question, just maybe awkwardly placed and timed and positioned as something came up. And that's okay too. Uh, but when we do things like Judas did here, it's usually an indicator of a hidden motive of some kind. And ultimately, I've also learned that these kinds of questions reveal more about the heart of the person asking it uh, than the situation as a whole. Uh, so it's easy to just kind of sometimes let it go. Now, here's what I would also want to say at this point in the message, never would I ever suggest that hard questions should not be asked or that truth should not be pursued. Friends, hear me clearly. Truth should always be pursued in the right context. And the right context within the, uh, the church Jesus laid out is one-on-one. -on -one. And so this takes me to the next lesson from Judas's buzzkill response. Hard questions are perfectly appropriate to ask in the right context and setting. And that setting is one-on-one. -on -one. You know, if a workplace or a church or an organization does not create clear avenues for truth to be communicated and questions to be asked, even hard questions, I believe that is equally wrong and difficult. And even as an individual person. You know, if you and I don't let people into our lives to speak hard truth and ask the pointed questions at us in private contexts, uh, that's not okay either. We have to be willing to open ourselves up 
to being asked hard questions. Now, let me point this out to you. In Judas's case, he had all kinds of time in the world to ask Jesus every hard question he wanted to. He was around the Lord 24-7. And he, the Bible tells us he was the one with the money bag. So it's likely Jesus had to talk to him about purchases or things that needed to be done. Judas could have handled this a million different ways. He could have waited till the moment was over and pulled Jesus aside and like, hey, you know, I, I I had a question about that. It seemed kind of off and odd to me. What, what was going on there? He could have waited till the whole night finished and asked him the question. He could have waited till the next day and asked him about it. But Judas chose that moment to make a public scene of it. Uh, and it really revealed more about him. Um, he didn't choose to go one-on-one the way that Jesus had taught them to in the word. Um, now, the other disciples who had the same question as Judas did, by the way, uh, and it did tell us they talked amongst themselves. We don't really know if they were gossiping about it or not. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't. doesn't matter. What it seems to be is that the other disciples seem to have held their question in trust and in faith of Jesus. And I think that's what we're supposed to do too uh, in those kinds of settings. Um, and here's the thing though, and this is what I want to get to. It didn't matter what the other disciples thought or didn't thought about Mary of Bethany's act of generosity. It mattered what Jesus thought of Mary of Bethany's act of generosity. Amen? You know, what it came down to was Jesus was blessed by it. And that much was evident. You know, no matter what your view is on a certain issue, you will be able to find someone and likely lots of someones who share your view. And you know, the point in the church is not to build constituencies around different types of issues and how many people agree with this or or, or that and try to steer the church accordingly. The point in the context of a church is to find what is right in the eyes of the Lord and do that. That's the point of the church. Now, let me just speak personally here for a minute. In our case here at City Church, I believe every leader in our church to be incredibly easy to communicate with. We respond to every email. Uh, you know, we make ourselves available if people want to meet with us, uh, you know, including if it, with an elder, if uh, that is something that they, you know, they want to do, if they have a particular issue. We hand out our cell phone numbers. People have them. Uh, you know, we don't hide behind administrative assistance or, or policies. What we're here to do is to speak truth and do it freely. And there's beyond ample opportunity to connect one-on-one when there's a genuine issue or concern. And And here's what it always creates. It always creates a massive buzzkill when people go nuclear with an issue publicly like this instead of uh, just bringing it one-on-one. You know, so I just want to point out when Mary disagreed with what the Lord had done, she threw herself at his feet in surrender. She brought it to him one-on-one even though she didn't like the outcome. And you know, here's what I want to tell you. You can ask hard questions. You should. It's all in how we do it that reveals our hearts. Um, you know, the same thing is true today that, that public negativity uh, like Judas showed is always buzzkill and it's always awkward. But there is a right way to do that um, and there is a right way to do it from a heart of uh, towards the Lord of worship and a posture like Mary sat. Now, it's also true that different groups of people will just see issues differently. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? It's just a fact. Like, how many of you remember uh, a few years back, four or five, I don't know, the white and gold dress, white and purple debate that happened in society? Anybody? Okay, how many of you saw white and gold? Okay, you have the heart of the Lord, right? How many of you saw white and, and purple? How many of you guys saw the white and purple? Or what was it? What was it? They get it wrong? Black and purple. What, okay, you get the point. Some people are wrong, and that's just the way it is. And I was right seeing it white and gold. That's the way it was. Um, actually, I saw this like funny, funny video afterwards from an ophthalmologist, and they talked about like how literally based off like the size and shapes of people's cones or whatever were in their eyes, that they literally 
saw it differently. Uh, and neither one was being disingenuous or whatever. They, it was based on their genetics, biology. They could just see things totally differently. And, and the same thing is true in life, you know, based on people's upbringing, their genetics, their family, what kind of, you know, abuses they've been through or good experiences they've had, the choices they've made, you know, all these things skew our perspective in life. And so some people are just going to see things differently. And it's important within the context of the church to be able to preserve the unity of the body of Christ. You know, the Bible speaks to the importance of unity above just about everything else. Not absolutely everything. There are places where, you know, we need to clearly uh, state where the Bible says something and maybe it's different from what somebody's saying. But in unless it's something illegal or immoral, and I want to be very clear, unless it's one of those two, we need to guard the, uh, the unity of the church at just about all time. So one last time, the right context and setting uh, to vocalize disapproval or frustration is always one-on-one. And from there, within the context of the church, if a person's grievances remain, uh, the Bible says you can take it with an elder. You can grab another leader and sit with that person, not solo, but sit with that person, hear it out. Um, you know, and, and if from there, you know, you, you still don't get the outcome that you want, man, bring it before the, the elders of the church. If it's really something that is frustrating. Um, and if after that, You don't receive the answer that you want. Here's what the Bible puts on every single one of our hearts to do. It's time to let it go and trust the Lord. Um, And, you know, here's the thing. As elders of the church, leaders in the church, we're not perfect either. We know that. And so there's going to be times uh, where we're learning and we're growing through things. But if you truly are in the right and an entire group of elders is in the wrong who who, who are overseeing a church, here's what I would ask you. Don't you think God's big enough to reveal that eventually in his perfect time? He is. And so there's a reason in Scripture that God tells us not many of you should aspire to be teachers and elders and leaders in the church because God says we're going to be judged with stricter uh, accountability. Now, I think definitely that means eternally, but I also think that that means here and now. Um, and so I will put this whole kind of discussion today uh, with to close with, with a question. And really the question that comes from Mary of Bethany's story more than anything else is this. Am I giving God my best. She was extravagant in her display of love for God, for Jesus. Um, and so you have two examples. One is Judas, who's off to the side, uh, questioning, judging privately and eventually publicly. And the other example is Mary of Bethany at the feet of Jesus, trusting him, worshiping him his, her whole life. Uh, and eventually, when he raised her brother Lazarus from the grave, she offers this radical display of generosity that became both beautiful and prophetic in its own way. Um, and it also led to this story being codified as Bible for all all time and all generation. Uh, another translation uh, says that, uh, or another dis- uh, version of this passage in one of the other gospels says that it was something that was to share the gospel for all generations and all time. So I want to ask you a question today. As you probe the depths of your heart here, um, who are you more like? Are you more like Judas? Or are you more like Mary of Bethany when these kind of hard issues come up? Um, and, and so what I believe with all my heart is that when we are Mary of Bethany's before the Lord, that God is the one who will put on our hearts what it means to live extravagantly for him every single day. And I want to encourage you to be a Mary of Bethany and you watch as God uses your life as a living testimony. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your extravagant love. And Lord, today we know that from your perspective, even our most extravagant display of worship and love is very small. And yet, God, we want to bring you our best in everything, in our time, in our talent, in our treasure. God, everything that we have is yours. We love you, Lord, and we bring ourselves to you God, may we be a people who bring our best to you. May we be a church who brings our best to you. And if you're in here today and you were to walk out the doors of this church and you genuinely don't know if you would go to heaven when you die, 
I believe God brought you here today to settle that question once and for all. Uh, I want to tell you God promises to do four things for you. He promises to forgive you of your sins, past, present, and future. He promises to adopt you into his family, call you his own son or daughter. He promises to fill you with his spirit so you can live the life that he's called you to. And finally, he offers you an eternal life that's beyond anything that you could ask for, dream, or imagine. There's only one catch. Jesus wants the steering wheel of your heart. And so if you're ready to step over the line and call yourself a, a committed follower of Jesus, this is your moment to come to Jesus. It's not mystical or magical. God hears the faith. Pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin and the sins of the world. I believe you died there, and I believe you rose from the grave so I could have everlasting life. Lord, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin and fill me with your spirit and give me the power to live this life for you. God, I'm tired of running. Here's the steering wheel of my heart. Take over. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.